stupid punk rock. I don't, you know, I just think of it as rock and roll because that's what it is. This is Stan with the Punk Rock Chronicles back again in West Hollywood now uh, on the rooftop of a cool hotel. I'm with my buddy Bob the Bastard. Hey. And we've got a really special guest today. We've got Glenn Madlock. Hi, how are you doing, Stan? All right. Yeah, thank I'm you. Up. Thank you for meeting with us today. Um, yeah, we just kind of wanted to talk to you about, I mean, we're just fans of yours, and we would like to just get to know you and, and understand your history. and. Can you kind of just talk about, you know, growing up, like, uh, you know, in, in England and, and as a youth and what, what it was like back then? Well, it's a bit of a long story. And <laughs> <laughs> but I was born in this place, well, I still, where I still live, actually, not in the same house, but an area called Paddington. And there's a road called the Harrow Road that goes up to Kensal Green, which is like, might as well be in the middle of nowhere, really. It's just not really part of the whole kind of London thing. But what it was, was um, one of the earliest sort of West Indian immigrant communities. When I went to school, it was pretty much half black and white. But all those kids' parents, in the summer, they'd have the windows open and they played Bluebeat and Scar. And it was kind of pretty cool. In fact, we used to have a kick around with one of the, if playing for soccer in the street, with one of the guys who was a Latin member of the, the Scatolites. So it's kind of quite sort of tuned in there. But but growing up, I mean, I suppose lots of people my age, the same age as me over here, but we we didn't really have very good radio back then. We still don't really, but what sprung up in the very early 60s, there was um, pirate radio stations. There's Radio Luxembourg, which was allowed to be, and you could probably get American Forces Network but there was these stations that were on boats just outside British territorial waters. In fact, there was a movie made about it. It was a bit of a jokey thing called The Boat That Rocked. Right, I don't know if you saw that. Um, some guy's supposed to be like Wolfman Jack in it. And, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, okay. But they were playing all the early, and all the kids sort of kind of got for Christmas a little cheap transistor radio, which had just come out. And those radio stations played like the Kinks and the Who and the Yardbirds and the Early Stones and my favourites, the Small Faces. So you go to bed at night and you know you'd have it underneath your pillow listening to it. Everybody did it, and that's kind of what got me interested. And then I think we had the best TV show ever called Ready Steady Go, where those bands would play live, and maybe the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five. And Dusty Springfield was on it a lot, and there was a tour coming over to England, which. I'd read hadn't been doing very well, which Dusty Springfield got hip to. And it was the Tamla Motown tour. And she insisted all those people went on the TV show and then they became a big success. Wow. You know, and you see Smokey Robinson and maybe Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and Sam Cooke, and all were playing live. And that's what got me going, the, mu the music, really. Wow. So that's like the sort of 65, 66, 67. Were there venues nearby? Did you ever well, I was Well, I was too young at that stage. Yeah. You know, How old were you when you started? Well, I was about ten, 10 or 11. Yeah. You know, I was born in 56, so oh. 65, 66. In fact, I was going through my records for another radio show just before I came away, and I found the first two records I'd actually bought with my own pocket money, which was You Really Got Me by the Kinks. Oh, nice. And the Sus and Shout EP. Nice story. Still got it. You know, that's <laughs> wow. kind of cool. Original but, press. Yeah. Wow. But, but, but when I was older, I got kind of hip to you know, shows and, and clubs and things. I'd, quite an early age, I went to see, to High Park, there was a free concert. I, I, I had a job on the Saturdays. I had to deliver food, you know, to Mrs. Brown's shopping for the week or Mrs. Jones's laundry or something. And because of that, I missed the Stones playing in Hyde Park, oh. <laughs> right? And then maybe a month later, there was another show going on and I pulled a sickie and I went to see Humble Pie supporting Grand Funk oh, Railroad. Nice. So that was, that's kind of one of my earliest memories. And I started going to pubs. There was this sort of pub rock scene going on. Um, 
When did you actually start playing? Well, music? around about the same time. I had a guitar when I was 10. And in fact, if you ever go to London, somehow, I don't know how it's ended up there, but it's in the vault in the Hard Rock, which is the first Hard Rock ever in London, in Piccadilly. And opposite it, there's their, like their merchandising place, and it's in an old bank. And downstairs, there's like, you know, which is supposed to be the vault, but it was a vault. There's Jimmy Page's Telecaster or something, and Roger Entwistle's bass, and Jimmy Page's Flying V, and Les Paul's number two Les Paul, all arranged around this safe that looks like it's had the door blown off. And in it is the acoustic guitar my mum and dad bought me when I was 10. It's fantastic. And I was chatting to the, the girl who takes the tours around. All the kids pick up on that the most because it's something, you know, they don't know who Jimi Hendrix was, but they kind of can a cheaper, appreciate a cheap acoustic guitar. So it's kind of, it was all intertwined, you know, with me learning and getting hip to this kind of music. And, um, you, you know, parents? things kind of sort of developed from there, you know, and it got a bit prog rock, which I didn't really like, but I would see sort of bands, and then this pub rock thing started, and most of it wasn't very good. But there were a few bands, Kilburn and High Roads, which was Ian Dury's band before he formed the Blockheads, the Stranglers were on at the tail end of that, the 101ers, which was Joe Strummer's band, and Dr Feelgood, who were kind of cool, you know, they had something going. Nice. And that's when I'd met Steve and Paul, you know, I'm talking like 75, 74, 75 now. But I'd go and check out bands, go to Marquee, and in fact there, there was one pub that was right over the other side of London, and I got mated with Bernard Rhodes, who went on to manage The Clash, he was friends of a Mount McLaren. And we, saw, and we would look, this is like the birth of punk, and we'd look for a name in the Melody Maker, somebody playing that might sound sort of punky, and there was a band called the Teenage Rebels, so we went right across town to go and see this band. And they weren't punk rock at all, and they certainly weren't teenagers, and they weren't rebellious. <laughs> and after the gig, Bernard Rose got hold of the guy, he said, look, we come all the way over here to, to see you, and you're not teenagers, and you're not rebellious, and the guy, I said, well, that's it, we're rebelling against teenagers. <laughs> and Bernard Rhodes <laughs> was, was um, totally, you know, lost the words for about the one time in his life. It was funny. But he was always checking things out. And through that, I kind of, you'd see the same people at gigs. It might be Mick Jones or Tony James or the guys from The Damned and Vivian Albertine. And well, it was all that. And around about the same time, I was going to art college. And again, there was a scene there, and I booked the first pistol shows at the art college I went to, and another one. And, wow. and you'd see the same people, and all these people started to intermingle. So in England, that was the, the birth of the punk rock kind of crowd. How did you, um, so could you talk us through like getting the Sex Pistols? How did that all kind of come well, together? Well, it was a long gestation period, but I got a job in this weird shop down the King's Road called Let It Rock, which was a teddy boy shop. I don't know if you guys know what teddy boys are, but they were sort of like rock and roll types, where they wore long drape jackets and crepe, you know, brothel creeper shoes and stuff. And it was a total antithesis of what was going on in the UK at the time, where everybody but everybody had long hair and flares. You know, even the milkman would have flare trousers as a bank manager if he had one back then. So to be a teddy boy was kind of being a bit different. And Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood had this shop, but they got kind of fed up with that, and they changed the name of the shop, which was called Let It Rock, to Sex, which was quite, you know, it had this big garish sign on the King's Road, and a different clientele of people would start coming in. And that's when I met Steve and Paul, you know, and they had a band, and they was looking out for a bass player, and I wouldn't say I was a bass player at the time, but I had a bass, and I started joining them. And that's when we became the, the Sex Pistols. We were the Pistols from the sex shop, so there's an obvious pun, but that's kind of... And then we met John, you know, and it started um, taking on a whole different thing. How did you uh, write those early songs? I know you are a big part of that. Yeah, well, we'd all sort of work on ideas at home, and then we kind of in quite short order, we got our own rehearsal place in Denmark Street, which is London's Tim Pan Alley and it had a whole history there. Then we'd hang out there and rehearse most days because we didn't have much else to do, really, you know. What was good about it, if you, I mean, I know here, you know, people have sort of garage bands and you actually have a garage. Nobody's got a, London, a garage in London, you know, there's not room for it. 
But to have a place where you could leave your gear set up and you could rehearse every day was cool. Normally, if you had to hire a rehearsal place, you spend ages getting there, and then you set up your equipment only to find out nobody's got a good idea. At least we could find out nobody had an idea by the no next way. day, you know. And <laughs> it was like popper putting things in and a couple of songs Steve had written before John was involved, like Lazy Sod, that one, or 17, sort of, that, and a couple of other things. And then John adapted the words. I had some ideas. A Pretty Baker Mum was a pretty much finished song. And some of the things came from, you know, I've got this riff here, it goes down, and then we'd argue over where it would go. In fact, I've, I met um, uh, uh, from the Kinks, uh, Ray Davis, a uh, gig, he was, he was open for us. In fact, it was the last gig we ever did, probably, with the Pistols in Spain, and all the dressing rooms were next door to each other, and they were, like, in a port cabin, you know, where the wall doesn't go quite up to the ceiling. And John was in the next room, and I went and said hello to Ray Davis. He said, oh, you're the guy who wrote all the songs in here. I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he said, come off it, somebody's got to be in charge. He said, we used to go in, and I'd bring a song in. He said, and we'd, we'd have fist fights, how it should be arranged. He said, I always won. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you guys feel the chemistry pretty pretty quickly together? Yeah, kind of. I mean, yeah. he was never... Did did you guys uh, pair up at all when it came to songwriting? Were there were members of the band that you had more in common with or got more done with? I, maybe initially with John. I mean, but the only song we ever really sat down and wrote together was that song, Submission, mm. where we traded line by line and then I worked, went home and worked some music out. Well, that was probably because Steve and Paul were lazy sods and they didn't turn up for the rehearsal. <laughs> you know what I wanted to know too is at the same time you're, you're in this band and everything's fresh. I mean, everything's fresh. Punk is a new thing. Most people. Well, it wasn't even called punk then. Right. It right. wasn't even called punk. Then. You're still with the Ted the Teddy Boys was the big movement. Well, that right. had kind of been and gone, you know, by by the time we was doing that. But what was happening was was that Malcolm, who had been going backwards and forwards to New York, met Sylvain and a few people, and then got involved with the Dolls, the tail end of the Dolls for a bit, and he'd heard about. The scene over there, and there was bands like Television and Richard Hell and the early Heartbreakers, but none of those people had made records. And he brought back some photographs and set lists and things like that and flyers, but we never heard them. We didn't know what they sounded like. The only thing that we did hear was there was a friend of ours who's older, who's mates with Malcolm, called Nick Kent, and he was like, for want of a better word, he was a star writer for this music magazine called The Enemy, The New Musical Express. It was kind of like the equivalent of Lester Bangs, I suppose, you know, that kind of guy. And a mate of his gave him a tape of some stuff he'd been working on, which he gave to us. And there was a song on it that we did a cover of, because we dug it. And it was Roadrunner. And it, it was look, Nick Kent's friend was John Cowell, and he produced this record. But it didn't come out for a year after that, until a year after that. So we was really quite in a sort of hip kind of place, you know. Yeah. What was the culture place. like at the time as far as were other kids starting to adopt this? Uh, no, no. Uh, kids, know, like... were, kids were kind of getting fed up a little bit yeah. with what was going on. What was going on was this pub rock thing. Disco was beginning to come through, which was kind of fun. Um, and then bands, you could go and see for quite a lot of money at Wembley or something like that, a charge of fortune. And it's like Barclay, James Harvest and ELO and, you know, singing about fairy, you know, the five wives of Henry VIII or whatever. It's got <laughs> well, nothing to do with story. us, you know, you know. It's the same story on both coasts, you know. Well, yeah, coasts. and I, th I think it was like the beginning of... You know, the global village, people, yeah. both sides of the Atlantic got fed up with the same things mm -hmm. at pretty much the same time. But there were other things from the 60s. I mean, we was kind of hip to that Nuggets album, you know, that Lenny K did, the Chocolate Mox Band and 30th Floor Elevators and things like that, and the Jagged Edge, what a great name for a band. <laughs> you know, that was kind of, they did night, so was that them, night time? In that time, you know, now that oh, yeah, yeah. Quite, is that Jagged Edge? I don't know. I think so. Yeah, and um, so there was a bit of that going on, kind of thing. But we all had different influences. Paul liked early Roxy music and Tamla. Steve picked up on the Dolls and thought he was Johnny Thunders for a bit. You know, we 
got hit, hit to the Stooges. But me, Stephen Paul, I had in common, and I was very privileged to kind of play in the version with it maybe about 10 or 11 years ago, is The Faces. We were yeah. big, big. John hated them. So that, yeah. You know, he liked Van de Graaff Generator. But there was other things like Can and <sighs> Captain Beefheart and things like that. So, you know, stuff that was a bit more kind of wacky and yeah. spiky somehow. You know, that's what we liked. What was that? Like, when you guys actually formulated enough songs for a set, what were those early gigs like? Mess. <laughs> Tr a drunken mess. Um, yeah, the first gig we did was at my art, art college, and even then we didn't even have a whole lot of songs of our own. We, there was a lot of covers, you know, what you're going to do by, by the small faces, and John wanted to do Through My Eyes by Through My Eyes, the dirge. Did you guys grow into, you guys were a pretty dynamic fan on stage, especially, you know, Johnny Rod and everything. Did this, did you grow into that or was it, you guys already pretty just, gregarious? At, you know, I think it's just kind of why we were really, you know. Yes. Excitable chaps. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, there's no of, point, been, I don't think any of us saw any point of going on stage and cowering in the corner, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's your chance. How were those uh, early gigs? How was the reception? What did people think? Well, the first one, they pulled a the plug on us. Oh, yeah. But it was this band, Bazooka Joe. And I think it was the first time John had heard himself sing for a proper sort of monitor system. And John started kicking it around because he probably didn't like what he was hearing. But the guys pulled the plug on us. Not it transpires because they didn't like us. It was because they had... I don't know if you know what it is over here. They, had, they bought this PA system on higher purchase, you know, where you pay it off in instalments and they hadn't finished paying for it and oh. they just borrowed it. <laughs> <laughs> Mid show repo. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah. That's crash. That'll put it into But, uh, you know, lots of things happened with the pistols. Like we did a show at uh, the Nashville and a fight broke out in the front yeah. row. And, well, you know, it was a couple of hundred people there. But, it, you do a gig, you know, two things might happen. A girl might take her top off, which yeah. is kind of good, <laughs> if you like that kind of thing, or a fight. But it's no good for the band, because nobody watches the band, everybody watches the fight or the girl. So this fight broke out, and we're trying to stop it, and somebody took a picture, and I think it was Joe Stevens, I think, and it ended up on the front cover of the Melody Maker. It was kind of like a, a happenstance, really. Yeah. You know, and there was loads of things that kind of... Added to that, added to our mistake. Yeah, and, and back to, was there anything else going on? No. I think lots of people in our kind of age group we were looking for something different, for some kind of change. And as soon as we stuck our heads above the parapet, they went, oh, that'll do, you know. So if you go and look for some trousers, pants, you don't really know which ones you want until you see them, you know. And that's what the sex You hear a was. lot about, we hear a lot in our interviews about how, um, People will tell you, you know, punk, some people will say punk rock is not, and no, it's not what it was, and never will be, and it, some people even think it's dead, whatever. But um, I feel like once you guys got established and got a name, and punk rock kind of took hold over there, um, you're probably just as inundated with people copying the fashion, but not so much the music and the art, just like any other scene, right? So was there a sort of a explosion of fashion? Yeah, and, yeah, well, all that kind of went hand in hand, you know, because yeah. Malcolm's shop was a clothes shop, you yeah. know. So was There'd it... be ideas coming from there, and people would wear a bit of that, and they couldn't afford it, so they'd make their own version of it, but different. Mm -hmm. And then people were doing artwork, and one of Malcolm's friends was Jamie Reed, who did um, the Nevermind the Bollocks cover a bit later on. But earlier on, we needed flyers for shows, right. and the state of the art were two things, the Electroset and the Xerox machine, black and white, right? But Electroset was a really expensive, and you always run out of E's, right? Which is the most popular character in the alphabet. <laughs> and it's expensive, so a friend of Malcolm's, Helen, who's little, the, the, the dwarf girl who's on, in the rock and roll swindle, she was his mate from art college. She just cut out things from the ne letters from the newspaper because it was cheaper, and then, and that kind of you know, so it looks like, um, you know, like a ransom note kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. DIY ransom. So all these little things just yeah, yeah. added up, you know. But we weren't the only people who've ever done that, you know. I'm sure in New York they were doing 
a Let's similar you, thing. Yeah. I know you guys were from LA, but you know our connection was was with New York. And in fact, the first time I come to LA, I was playing with Biggie Pop. And yeah. I met some people, and they're going, "Yeah, we're, we're punk rockers. You want to come to this party after the show? Sure." And you get out, and you know they got a leather jacket on, and they've got like a drop head Cadillac Eldorado or something. I was like, "This ain't quite." <laughs> and then I remember going to Seven Eleven with them, and. I was just chatting to the guy, and I didn't realise these guys. I suppose they were punk rock because while I was talking, they was using me as the as the front while they were putting all bottles of stuff. <laughs> Your beer run. So it was the same but different, you know. Yeah, yeah. What do you yeah. call it? A beer run. <laughs> Quick question. So when you guys, you said when you guys just started the Sex Pistols, you didn't really have the the word punk didn't wasn't even invented yet. When did you start noticing that word come around? Well, what happened was there was two magazines. Melody Maker, and there was another one called Sounds, and there was a girl who wrote for Melody Maker called Caroline Coon, who'd been quite a bit of a name in the alternative press in the late 60s, you know, International Times and things like that. And there was a Canadian guy who was living in London called John Ingman. He wrote for Sounds, and they were hip to what we were trying to do. And somehow between them, they'd come up Presumably because they'd heard the word punk from America. I mean, we only knew it from like the James Cagney movie, you know, you, you dirty punk. Huh? <laughs> and then one week they did public articles on us using the word punk. We'd never heard it before. We weren't too happy about it. And you know, if you look up what it means, it's not particularly yeah. savoury, you know. <laughs> but reading one, I remember reading through one of these articles with John. And they started mentioning all these other bands that started out. And I said, I don't really kind of get the gist of the whole thing. John said, I do. It says we were the first. So we were. So you guys were pretty influenced, in a sense, by New York, what was going on over there. Did people, and you traveled to New York, did people come from New York to England to check you guys out, check out bands? No, but I hadn't been to New York then. No, but did, did anybody, was there any, like, traveling done between... Well, them? a little bit. There was, a, you know, John uh, Malcolm was doing that, and there'd be Americans right, but in, I, in London, you know, and also, because I worked in the store, there, there was people coming in, because it was kind of wacky. Yeah. You know, I, not, I wasn't there, but Iggy had gone in there, and, and, and then Malcolm was taking stuff to the New York Dolls, and, I mean, one day I even... I, Opened the door and Mick Ronson and, and Ian Hunter came in. I sold Mick Ronson a pair of pink loafer shoes <laughs> that he wears in that movie Ronaldo and Clara. And he was he was sweet because he's got he had really small feet. I had to get all these shoes down in the boxes and then we found a pair and I'm wrapping them up. And I heard this noise and I was going on, look round and he's up the ladder. I said, what are you doing up there? He said, I'm putting the shoes back for you. I said, I've got them all out. And I'm going, you can't do that. You're Mick Ronson, you know. Because we, I mean, there were other things that we were hip to, you know, like the Spiders from Mars and yeah. early Roxy Music and, yeah, yeah. and Lou Reed's Transformer album. And then also another thing that was going on, and Malcolm and Vivian had done some clothes for it, was rock, uh, the Rocky Horror Show. But at that stage, it was just a stage play in the King's Road Theatre. And some of those people would come in, like Richard O'Brien and Little Nell, and it was quite, who were all older than us, but we were like, yeah, we're kind of on this scene kind of thing, you know. And then just down the road was Granny Takes a Trip, where the stones and the faces would get their clothes from. So, it, you know, it was this kind of mix of all these things. I like that you were, your formative years not just with the Pistols, you've done so much you know, besides that, but at that time, you're forming that band, you're perfecting your instrument, you're learning, you know, you're probably learning on the, on the go, right, a bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I know you played before, but you're, you're getting dialed in with a band and everything. At the same time, parallel to that, there's this whole emerging scene and different art, different way of thinking, yeah. the antithesis to the bloated rock band, stadium tour stuff. Yeah. Um, all that's happening at one time, and um, the shift must have been pretty profound. Well, it was, but when you're in it, you sort of see it gradually, and it feels kind of natural. You know, sort of one week you don't know what you're doing, and then you meet Steve and Paul, and that's kind of cool. 
and then you're playing with them, and then next week, Mick Ronson comes in, so, <laughs> you know, and then the week after that, you meet Richard O'Brien from the Rocky Horror Show and think that, you know, the guy who wrote it, and you think, oh, he's kind of interesting. You might not become friends with him, but you're rubbing shoulders with these people. Sure. Sort of incrementally, you kind of realise, actually, I'm in quite a good spot, you know. It's so, to develop that, that attitude of, that, like we said, a global community starting to kind of take shape a little bit, right? Well, that, yeah, and, 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 you know, and then people started travelling a bit more. As bands got run up and running, lucky I've got flown business class to... First time I went to New York, I was playing with Iggy Pop and we played the Palladium on Halloween night and the whole audience was dressed in Halloween costume. And in England back then, nobody really celebrated unless she was in some kind of weird village in the Cotswolds. Oh, that'd be the night when all the spirits... Weirdos, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that's going, and the Cramp supported us. You know, yeah. that was kind of cool. And then I started hanging out in New York after that. But around about that time, and people forget this, but there was a Laker Airlines who were doing, like, um, what you call standby fares for hardly any money at all. And he didn't last, but it made the other airlines do that. And you could get to New York for, like, kind of £20. Right. So all of a sudden, London was full of people from New York, and New York was people... All that was kind of going on. You know, then I met, like, Thunders and Sylvain and people like that. Seems like it was like in then, a year from '76 to '77, a lot happened. Yeah, right? yeah. Because really, a lot of bands started popping off in '77. You know, but when was the, I was curious. When did you first hear the Ramones? Well, the first time I, we heard them, we I went to see them play at um, a club called um, Dingwalls. We all went to see them, and we were like, "Wow, they're kind of sort of on the same page as us." I don't think we'd had a record until we saw them. You know, I mean, the only thing we'd really heard was this tape of um, Jonathan from Richmond and Modern Lovers. About your recording of the first record, um, how was the process? Because you guys were all young, you're wild. You, you got to go to a studio now and you have to do this sort of semi-professionally. Well, the very first recording we did, we went to the studio and Chris Spedding, who was another person who came to the shop, was like the ace sort of session guitarist in London at the time, and there's also the lead guitarist in the Wombles. Do you know who the Wombles are over here? He was the lead guitarist. In fact, one night he was doing Top of the Pops <laughs> live, and we was watching it, and he's got his Womble outfit on, because they were all furry animals, but he's got his Flying V and the leather biker's cap that he <laughs> bought from Malcolm for the guy, God, Chris. But he came in the studio with us, and we sat up, and he sat up a few run-throughs and play, and then, then we'll record it, right? Yeah. And then after we'd had about three or four goes through the songs, he said, oh, come and listen. OK, and he, he kind of recorded it. And he's going, but what do we have? He said, well, you didn't turn the red light on. We wanted the red light on. He said, no, come and listen. And he deliberately didn't put the red light on so you didn't get uptight and, you'll, you oh. know, all the notes fall off. Oh, but that was our first demos. Wow. So did you guys feel pretty, you felt pretty comfortable right off the bat? You didn't feel too, uh, too much pressure? That was, we weren't really kind of guys who felt uncomfortable that much. Yeah, probably not. We were, we were full of ourselves, didn't we? Yeah, and you had no idea where Loud, it was proud end. and wrong. Because you, <laughs> you had no idea where this was going to end up at the time. It was just a good time. Well, saying that, we were deadly serious. We knew exactly the kind of music we didn't want to play, you know, like the ELO and the things I mentioned earlier. But we were going to do it anyway. But it kind of came out how it came out. But on the other hand, I think in that respect, we're not that much different from a lot of what bands do. But we got caught up, you know, we did this TV show and we was on the front page of the papers because Steve swore his head off because he drank a bottle of Blue Nun wine to himself as well. <laughs> yeah, that's an infamous interview. Which loosened his tongue, <laughs> you know, and then it, all, then it all became different. So when did you start thinking, well, first of all, how did you enjoy the notoriety you were starting to get, and when did it shift to not being so much it was, fun? It was funny. I always thought it was kind of funny. But we did the anarchy tour, and like, we was going up and down the country, and weren't allowed to play here, but we had to turn up, otherwise we wouldn't have got the deposit we would have, you know, and it was like, is it, um, you know, can you be dealing with the, the censorship of what was going on? Sure. So we 
wasn't going to. Well, we was all on board with that, but it became sort of quite a living in the goldfish bowl, and then tensions became quite high between everybody. And I'm not the only one to say this, but I think as soon as John got his face in the newspaper, he changed. Yeah. I think he went to his head, you know. It tends to happen. So when did you start thinking that maybe this wasn't going to be such a long-term thing for you? Well, really early yeah. 77 then, you know. We'd done Anarchy by then. Most of the songs have been written that ended up, never mind the bollocks. You know, I don't play on all the never mind the bollocks right. at all, but all the donkey work had been done, you know. And I was feeling I wasn't being backed up by Stephen Paul, so I walked, you know. Yeah. I know it's been said that I was sacked, but it's not true. So, yeah, I re you read a lot of stuff about the the tumultuous relationships you had within a band, but there wasn't all that much drama, right? You just sort of... Well, I think the big problem with the sex was, was nobody actually really talked. Mm. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. What about uh, once you left, they were... When you left, they were still completing the first album, right? Yeah. And they brought you back to it. To I, I, I was asked to play on a couple of things, and I actually got paid for it, but I didn't do it in the end. So Steve plays a lot of the bass on that. But as again, my claim to fame is just a lot of those songs. Right. So especially the first three singles. It's my donkey work. You know, and then just moving forward, when we reformed in 96, I mean, they could have asked anybody in the world to play bass for them, and they asked me, so I kind of felt vindicated really you know yeah, it was, it was well earned so when you guys started doing that uh first tour what what other bands were supporting you at that time oh well initially the damned the clash and the heartbreakers but malcolm didn't get on with the dams manager jake rivera and that so that didn't kind of last so you know, it was a clash and the heartbreakers but we only did we only did about three shows out of 27. Oh damn! You know, it, so uh, it, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of irrelevant. Really. Yeah, it's a cool flyer, but I guess it didn't happen. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. But that's then, true. then sort of quickly after that, I, I started forming this other band, the Rich Kids, which we kind of had our moment in the sun over there, and I'm quite proud of them. You had a pretty decent charting single, didn't you? From yeah, that the, band? that's the. Eponymous, I don't quite know what it means, but I think it means it's called the same as what the, uh, the, the band were called, were called Rich Kids, that did all right, and the album sort of did okay, but, you know, I, I didn't want to be form a band and be second division Sex Pistols, which would have been quite easy, so I want to try something different, so I met Steve New, who's a fantastic sort of young whiz kids guitarist who could play heavy duty punk rock, or Charlie Christian, you know, kind of cool, Rusty Egan and Midge And It's one thing I admire about all you pistols is that when when it it kind of imploded, you guys went your different ways, the music that you put out, it wasn't just Pistols 2.0, you know. You you went on to the Rich Kids, and then there were, at some point there was like PIL and all these other, but they're all very different musically. Yeah, but, you know, a, a, a good band is always, hopefully, the total is more than the sum of the parts of the music, musicians that's in it, you know. You can't get a guy who's as talented as Steve New or Midget and say, no, I want you to play exactly like Steve Jones. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, and I'd appreciate it more that they say, no, fuck off it's on me, yeah, you know. You do your own thing. But most yeah. people are like that. I guess so, but some people, they'll, they'll, they'll hit, they'll strike gold with a band. But then that's their formula for the next 40 years, which if you're Levy from Motorhead, that's fantastic. It's all you ever wanted to do. But some people get themselves pigeonholed. Oh, yeah. And that's what I've tried not to yeah. do you through, did a good job. through my career. Well, it's been pretty up and down, you know. But the you thing is to kind of, between the sine wave of the roller coaster of your career, yeah, is to have a line job. that's going, <laughs> going up slightly, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ebbs and flows. Um, when did you first meet Sid Vicious? Uh, he came in the shop. No, the first time I met him was when I'd left. He, it was a Roxy Club. I went in there and he came in and I went to have a pee and he followed in and he was like, man, oh, I'm in the bass player now. And <laughs> you all know. I said, well, you can't play bass. And he said, well, well, so what? And I said, well, you've got to be able to do it a bit, Sid. You know, and he wanted to have a fight. And I, I said, I'll I I tell you what. He said, what? 
I said, well, I'll give you some lessons if you want. He went, really? And we kind of got on like that. Yeah. I was trying to defuse it a little bit. Well, I weren't scared of him. He was a big girl's blouse, basically. But he was there with John, and John had egged him on to kind of... To fuck with you? Yeah. <laughs> and then when we come out, we were sort of like matey. John was like... I like your approach, you know, yeah. just diffuse it, offer to help the kid. Because that's a thing, too. Like, everyone wants to rewrite history. You didn't, you, you weren't rivals with any of those guys. They just, you want your own different directions. And, yeah. And uh, you were actually, from what I read, you were kind of friendly with uh, Sid, Sid Vicious. Yeah. Well, we were neighbors in London. Yeah. And um, we go to the same pub, so you couldn't have an argument every night if you yeah. didn't have a quiet beer, you know. And then we were sitting next to each other and... He said, well, people seem to think we're enemies, but we're sitting there. You know, what can we do about it? I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, we could do a gig. And then we did this one-off gig. And we've got Steve and Rat Scabies played. And then it sort of kind of word of mouth. We decided on the Monday to do it, and we did it on the Saturday, saying it rammed. Quite a big gig in London. Just doing covers and... You know, the was regular Sid Stooges singing? thing, pardon? Was Sid singing or...? Was Sid, well, in fact, he said to me, he said, he said, who should we go? And I said, well, we could get Steve on guitar. And he said, oh, yeah, I like Steve and Rat, yeah, on drums. And that'd be it, four of us. And he went, right, hang on a second, I'm a bass player and you're a bass player. Who's going to play bass? And I said, look, Sid, I'm not going to sing. And he went, well, who's going to sing then? I said, you're singing. He said, well, he's going to play bass. I said, but how about if you sing and I play bass? He went, oh, all right, I'll get it. <laughs> but we'd had, had a few beers by that time. Nice. <laughs> that sounds cool. But we did it. But the, then loads of people come. And now I'm sitting here because I'm playing with Blondie. And I think that was the first night I met Blondie. Blondie came. Oh, nice. Good. You know, we would have so kind she of... saw that gig. Well, with... the whole band. And what I liked about Blondie was that, you know, they'd been... Because like, now we're talking late 77, 78, something like that. But, you know, when bands go to a different country, you don't really know anybody, so you've got your gigs you're doing, then you've got a night off. Hey, what are we going to do? So it seemed like they went out and checked bands out en masse as Blondie, which I kind of dug, and I think that's when I met Clem first time, and I've become good friends with him over the years. You know, we've worked together on lots of different projects, you know, some pretty airbrained, but we kind of built up a rapport of playing together, you know. So. What year did you first go to New York yourself? 79. 79. And with, with Iggy. Okay. And, oh, that's right. And what did you, what was your impression of, like, CBGBs or Max's and all these I, I never, I went to Max's quite a lot. Hmm. I never went to CBGBs. The only, to see a band, the only time... Maybe in the early, very early 80s, I got a guided tour one afternoon by Stid Baters, who I was become friends with, and he told me some stories that I can't possibly divulge to anybody anywhere ever. Wow. Right. So, but I, do you know what? I thought it was... I couldn't believe how small it was, and I couldn't believe what a shithole it was, and it was a shithole because the floor was covered in dog shit. <laughs> really, it was. He really had a dog, I think, he didn't let out. But what Max's I went to quite a lot, you know. What, what was your impression of Max's? And the, it was the... kind of a cool scene, and I, it, for me, it was exciting being there, because it's, you know, Velvet Underground, you know, live at Max's. A porno. Uh, can you get me a porno? You know, <laughs> you can hear it on the tape. When it, uh, so it kind of had a mistake, and there was a... And in fact, some guys that were friends in London who were musicians, that, that I think they ended up kind of running a night or two there, Barry Jones and Steve Deal. So it was the same, you know. What band, what, like when you were in New York in 79, what bands were you like checking out? Well, when I was there then, it was, um, I was pretty busy and then we went off around the States, but then we come back. But I do remember, well, I saw the Cramps and I just got to the Mud Club and see the Cramps a few times. Um, bands maybe, I mean, the funny thing was, the bands that you kind of know from coming from New York were probably all on tour in England by that stage. Yeah. I mean, I did see loads of bands, but I was pretty loaded as well. Yeah. But it's the clubs, I remember. In fact, I do remember going to a mud club for the first time, 
And they, you know, we never had this in England. They had the red rope and people queuing up. So I got in the back of the queue. And a guy with a clipboard, he come and got me. He said, Glenn, you don't do that here. You come in. Well, I, he got me in. And, and as I walked in, there was Wayne County. And it was in the winter. So there was a big, it's got a big coat on and a woolly hat. And I knew Wayne from back then. And I went, hi, Wayne. Next thing, wallop with a handbag that I hadn't seen, wallop. And I went sprawling across the floor oh, of the, the mud club because by that time I didn't know that Wayne was now Jane. But there was no difference. <laughs> in, <laughs> you know, in the big coat and the bully hat. So that, <laughs> you know, and the guy who's got me in is like... <laughs> <laughs> you saw a lot of these bands then, like, like Blondie, television, um, your dolls, yeah, your dolls, but also. Bad well, I like saw I saw the dolls being a big Faces fan back in '75. I went to see the Faces, and I'd heard about the New York Dolls, and they played at a place called Bieber. And Malcolm McLaren and this other guy who was a bit of a wheel in London who managed Kilburn and Yarra is called Tommy Roberts, but he had a shop called City Lights, and you know the suit that Bowie wears on the cover of Pinups, that's from City Lights. But to yeah. be honest. Steve and Paul were likely lads. And he didn't have many more suits to sell because they broke in the Knicks. <laughs> yeah. Right. But they played at Beavers, but I just heard about it and I didn't go. I was still kind of young then. And I went to see the faces at Wembley. And, you know, when you buy a ticket yourself, you want to get your money's worth. I went with my girlfriend at the time. And the opening band with the Pink Ferries, the faces of the headline, and the original New York Dolls with Billy Mercy of... Yeah. was supporting. So I saw that band then and that was like, wow, these guys have got something else going on. But somehow it kind of fitted with the faces thing. It was like that, but more, you know. Later on For you me, to, anyway. Later on you want to play with you got to play with the faces. That must have been interesting. Yeah. Fun for you because it's it's Well do you know what on that bill I played with the, the faces, although Rod didn't do it, but it was Ronnie and Kenny and Mac who I became friends with. The Dolls, I did a tour of Australia with Thunders and Nolan and Japan. Yeah. And then I became friends with Sylvain and we did a tour over it. But also the Pink Fairies, who's at that gig, their time had sort of been and gone and not particularly arrived. But they were nice guys, you know, it was part of this elaborate grove kind of, it's part of the Hawkwood Motorhead kind of thing. I actually had a jam with a drummer, Twink, in his bedroom in Salt and Crescent Hunts when he was trying to form another band. So I'd actually played with all those bands. <laughs> <laughs> so you're quite, quite yeah. a busy guy. Yeah. So how was your how was your how was your schedule what was your schedule even like? What was your life like at that time? Um well, you get busy with one thing and that happens and then it don't happen and you're trying to do another thing and then it's right up and down. But I think it's most musicians kind of yeah, I always find that fascinating. It's like a, it's a kind of a vagabondish kind of life in a way, right? You've got to be open to new ideas, opportunities. Well, you know, I've been saying, I've been doing a few interviews like this, but I think what I like about being a musician is, you know, the phone rings and somebody asks you to come and do something and you size it up and you say, yeah, you give it a go. And yeah, lots of musicians have different kind of combinations of people that I know. But, but I should think that every record comes out is probably ten that don't right. by people in, who are equally as good as each other who are having a go at do in something for free yeah. just to see what comes of it. And that's what I like about being a musician. People are kind of open-minded and you get people, you know, my new album, I've got like L Slicks all over it, who's that kind of guy. But, you know, it's only a... Not, I haven't got a massive record company behind me, you know, and you promise him in the earth and he gets a cappuccino and a sticky bun and he still does it. You know, I do the same for him, the same with Clems on a couple of tracks. And... Yeah. What was, um, so as the 70s closed out and you rolled into the early 80s, what, what was life like for you at that point? But they're all right, you know, I was gigging around. I had a band called The Spectres. I come and toured and did a club tour across the States, which was interesting, but that was off my own kind of back wasn't the best business move, but it was fun. I mean, we started off in San Diego 
with a station wagon with a U-Haul trailer on it, and we just drove ourselves from club to club and ended up in New York. In fact, I met a young lady in Chicago, and I went. She flew to New York, and I went to pick her up at the airport, and I parked the car sort of with a post, so the U-Haul trailer was behind the post, and she got and she didn't realise that there was a U-Haul trailer in the back of the car until we got to. <laughs> 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 Stuff like that, but you know, I knew people then, and I was sort of hanging around with Mick Ronson. It was, um, it was funny, he was up all night somewhere, and he went, Oh, I'm supposed to be in Los Angeles. When? <laughs> well, now my flight goes in two hours. Come on, let's get in the car. And we went and got in his car, and he had I don't know, a yellow sort of Mustang or something like that, but the front fender was all beaten up, and he'd had to go at doing the fibre class himself but got fed up halfway through. Yeah. So we all went out and <laughs> we'd all been up all night, I won't go into it. Drop him off at the airport, not not thinking, well, what, what are they going to do with your car? And he went, oh, well, you better have it. So then I drive back, <laughs> you know, my head's going boom, 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 through the rush hour in this big V8 car, which I've heard, you know, with the after wing hanging yeah, off yeah. it, it was a bit like, um, a what's that movie? Is it a California Suite with uh, Walter Matthau's got a big oh, yeah. Ferrari? <laughs> I felt like that. <laughs> well, I just parked the car up in the garage and left it. As soon as I got back to the hotel, the phone, phone rang and it was Mick's wife. She said, what you done with my husband? I said, well, he's in LA. And she went, ah, oh, no, so <laughs> I have a crazy kind of time. <laughs> Wild. What, um, so, but, so you start spending a lot of time in the United States. How did you like the United States? It's, it's different, you know, from where you come from. There's some like-minded people on the on the coasts. It's a bit different through the Midwest, but yeah, people so people here. are fine, you know. I mean, but the people you meet at gigs and sort of more sort of rock and roll places are kind of a bit more like-minded, you know. I never really went. Deep, deep south at all. In fact, until last year with Blondin, we actually played at the Grand Old Opry, which was wow. kind of cool. You know, yeah, very never cool. thought I'd ever be doing that. <laughs> yeah, but, but you never thought you'd have a guitar in the, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a vault. There's <laughs> lots of things I didn't think, and they, but they happened, you know. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, at, at the time, professionally, what were you, what, what project were you engrossed in? What were you doing? At well, I had Spectre's band, and then I, then I played with Thunders. Um, yeah, I did quite a lot of various different things, but it wasn't a big runaway success kind of period. But through it all, I've always written songs, you know, always written songs. And, and before long, you have enough songs for an album, and they're filling up your head. What are you going to do with them all? You might pitch a couple to people. and. Yeah, I like it, but it's not quite my kind of thing. And, uh, and you know, you can't clear out your mind of all these things unless you put them on a record and put, them, put it out, which is what I've been doing, you know. Did you write, uh, did you compose songs for other artists, write songs for I'd other artists? I'd better band? go, yeah. I've never been that successful with it, but I think my songs are quite sort of me, you know. Were you still following the, like, the, the punk scene going on, like, in the mid mid 80s like the hardcore punk scene at all is that something well i wasn't i don't didn't follow it you know when i think you got to remember i said i don't think any but any of the pistols really consider themselves punks we were the sex pistols mm -hmm. punk was something that came after it yeah uh, yeah and that was always interesting records what i liked about the english punk scene or even about the new york thing it's a very broad church you know and there's a big difference between the buzzcocks and the slits and the clash and wire. Totally different things, you know, and television are totally different from the Ramones and Talking Heads are totally different from Blondie. But they're still sort of punk somehow. And uh, there was a big political aspect, right, to, to like, I guess the Sex Pistols had the anti-government, you know, um, view, uh, you know, and that's what a lot of people gravitated to. Uh, I mean, is that something that you kind of gravitated well, to? Well, I think, you know, yeah. And my new album's called Consequences Coming, and that's what I say what's going to happen. And I had a single out at the start of the year called Head on a Stick. Now, you know, it's not exactly Will You Love Me Baby Till Tomorrow <laughs> and the song, you know. Um, yeah, I've always had that element 
to it. In fact, I, you know, my album's called Consequences Coming. Now, I don't know what your politics are. Hopefully your heart's in the right place. I was thinking, and I wrote a lot of the song because of Brexit and Boris Johnson in there, but was hip to what was going on over here. A couple of weeks back, I was in New York. I went to do a session with Clem, and I, was, I got asked to do some press. So I'm going to promote my album, Consequences Coming, which I was beginning to think maybe I missed the moment on that. Couldn't get a cab to go up from the Bowery up to Rockefeller Plaza because there was conniptions going on with the traffic. Because on Fifth Avenue, coming down from Trump Tower, was Trump going down to the main court downtown to be arraigned. Oh, yeah. And I've got consequences. <laughs> so maybe I hadn't missed my moment, you know. That's crazy, yeah. And it was all kind of happenstance again. <laughs> so the in the mid '80s, you're—I mean, you've been. But I like, yeah. But also in the mid '80s, I was pretty drunk, so yeah. I can't remember a lot of it. Mm. But you stayed pretty busy anyway. You didn't. Exactly I, try, I tried. I tried to. Yeah. yeah you didn't yeah. hold yourself. You're not the one to hold yourself away at a hotel. Room. It's never that much on the telly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my football team don't do that well. So, soccer team don't do that well. What made you decide to accept the Pistols reunion? What What What, what, what about that made you think you're ready to go back over that old ground. Well, what happened was was that I came, I'd made an album to creation records called Who's He Think He Is When He's At Home, and then was waiting for it to come out. And a friend of mine, Mickey Moe's son, Calvin Hayes, invited me over and he said, oh, I found this singer who might be good to do something with. So me and Steve New come over here and he didn't, the guy was great, but he wasn't quite what we were, we was looking for, so I was a bit of a loose end. And Calvin said to me, what are you going to do? You know, you're welcome to stay. And I thought, I'll hang out. I said, you know what, I haven't spoken to Steve Jones for 17 years. Maybe I should look him up. Uh -huh. And Calvin said, yeah. I said, well, I don't know how to get in touch with him. Next day, Calvin gave me a bit of paper. He said, there's Steve's number, call him. And I went, oh. For about a week, I didn't call him. Calvin every morning said, so call Steve. And, I, and finally I did. And Steve went, oh, I heard you was there. Come over. So I went to Steve's. And as soon as I got there, he said, let's go and see John. I was like, Ugh. you know, and a lot of shit had been said. Yeah. But it was fine. And um, when we was there, we jointly called up Paul in London. But he was out, left a message. And then he called us back and we was out. But it set the ball rolling. Early 96, we had a world tour. That's great. Man. So it was that... really quite last minute. Yeah. You know. But you guys did it. You, it was a very successful run, not just with the crowd response, but you guys held it together quite quite well. And you had a lot of good opening acts. You guys toured a lot of places. Yeah. Um, I mean, we went all around the world, you know, Japan, Australia. Yeah. We was in Japan like a month playing nearly every night, which you don't do. You did three Budokan, which is... Now, that was a long time between that reunion and now. Were, yeah. were there any talks at the time for you guys to regroup and do, an, do some sort there of... There was a bit of talk about it, yeah. you know, and I, when it was suggested, and I and Steve and Paul were up for having to go up writing stuff, but John never was. So I think he thought he'd detract from his public image thing. But I mean, the other thing, it's kind of people don't consider, but you're trying to do what you want to do, and you're kind of, from, to, you know, one step forward, two steps back, and then maybe one and a half forward, and you're getting somewhere. Then you do a Pistols thing, everybody loves you for that. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it finishes and you go back to what you were doing, you've gone backwards again. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it's such a big thing, and nobody in the band, no matter what they think, have ever really eclipsed the magnanimity of the Sex Pistols. Yeah. And, so um, you didn't feel that there was a bit of an elevation in your... Um... Stock. Yeah, yeah, after, yeah, after a bit, that, a bit. Wanted. But then you put something out, and they go. Then I was going to put this album out that I made for Creation. It was supposed to come out early in the year. Then they got wind of the Sex Pistols thing, and they thought oh, I'll put it out with that, which I didn't think was a good idea. And then it looked like I was cashing in, mm. you know. And then you go back after that, or come and reactivate this. Well, it's kind of. Well, you the know. thing about you that's different than some musicians is that you have. Well, the thing is, I know that's how it works. You've got to do this one thing properly, but I won't have it. <laughs> yeah, I respect that. Yeah. But you have, speaking of respect, that's what I was going to say is you have the respect of all these musicians. It seems like a lot of people either seem to be reaching out to you to play with them 
You, you, seem, you don't seem to have, be lacking for offers no. for collaborations and bands. I'm not bad on the bass. Yeah. I can write a tune. Yeah. I can strum a little bit, and I kind of learn how to put it across. I, mean, I don't know if you guys realise, but because I'm here, um, and my record's coming out, and we're going to put a show together at the Roxy, and Clem off offered to, to play drums. So we've got a friend of ours, Steve Fishman, on bass, and I said, we need somebody on the guitar. You know, and Al's right over on the East Coast, and I'll, I'll have to put him up when I can't afford to do that. And he said, how about Gilby Clark? So Gilby Clark, done not it? So. What about the, the Blondie connection? How, how did you get involved with them professionally? I um, knew them, but... Well, I knew him, and as I said, I've been, you know, good rapport with Clem, and I've been over here, I stay with him, and he stays with me in London, and he's doing some of the yeah. projects. And last, about this time last year, they were about to do a tour, and for some reason, I, I think he was a bit under the weather, their bass player, Lee, who was a great guy and a good bass player, wasn't working out, and Clem said, um, we're short of a bass player. Will you come and do it? And I said, well, well you know, when? Like a month or two. He said, no, next week. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Jump on it, right? <laughs> and I thought about it. I thought, yeah, no, I fancy doing it. I'm glad I did, you know. And so I was over there. I went to New York to see him. I was sorting out my work permit. And then we didn't do any shows. And then we came back. And the first show we did was in front of 20,000 people in the, the, the big arena. In, how many songs Gla did you have to Glasgow. Learn? How many how many songs did that well, set? Well, we probably looked at about twenty five or something, and I learnt <laughs> learnt a few when I was initially, and then they decided they didn't want to do them, or they was in different keys, and it was like <laughs> oh, wow, a lot of work. Yeah, I, I but it was kind of cool, you know. They keep throwing different ideas and to the mix. I mean, we did Coachella. So when you get like last opera, night, night before, and then um, they'd invited um, Mel Rogers up to play this other song that I'd never done before, but it's just a groove kind of thing. It's Are you going to be playing with Blondie for a while then? Are they going to be gigging for... Yeah, well, I mean, we've got another Coachella next weekend, we're doing the Greek, and then May is off and I've got shows with my own band in England to promote my, my record and a lot of the press and stuff. But then all through June, there's, there's big shows with Blondie, you know, festivals, so, so, some co-headline ones like Sting and we're down Glastonbury. Then there's a big show on the 1st of July, which is the last Blondie one for the time being, with Iggy Pop and Generation Sex, which is Steve and Paul. And Billy Idol and Tony James. Oh, yeah. Generation X. Yeah, yeah, but what, Generation X. What, what's good about that is they're on before us. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blondie's, yeah, That'll I mean, Blondie's like, that's, like top, that's a top act right there. Yeah. That's but it's got, I enjoy playing them because, you know, they're a class act. They've got a great yeah. body of work. It's all interesting stuff. You know, when you play with other people just playing on their songs, you know, somebody's written that song and it's got, they've got a different way of thinking of the way that you'd write a song. And it's like, initially, I mean, we don't do it, I don't know why, but Denis, Denis, you know, I can't, it's one of the songs I learned. Oh, yeah, I know Denis, she doesn't <laughs> want to do it for some reason. But it starts off in verse, chorus, and then there's a key change for the rest of the song. Now, normally a band would do a key change for the last verse and chorus or something. But yeah. It's just little <laughs> things like that, but you, you pick up ideas that you might not Nick, but sometimes you might do something where, oh, I could use that, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's all part of increasing or trying to replace the the, the grey cells and up here, you know. Yeah, yeah. keep evolving, yeah. really keep evolving. So with, with all this variety, with all these different players you've been playing with, how did that help shape consequences? And who did you get to play with you on the album? And who well, I, I've got a core band in England, a guy called Chris Musto. I used to play with Johnny Thunders and Nico and stuff. He's a good friend of mine. I went to see the Clash exhibition. and I recorded a lot of it just before lockdown, but I hadn't finished the whole singing and the words and things. And I went to see the Clash, and it was the, the Clash exhibition. And Norman Botro came up to me, you know, bass player from the Blockheads. So I, if I had my picture taken with him, I always go, 
bass player and bass player and half in. You know, he's he's good. I said, I don't know, what are you doing? What are you doing tomorrow? He said, well, nothing, why? I said, well, I'm going to start recording an album. I was going to play bass in it. I said, do you want to come and play bass? He said, I'd love to. I said, I would have thought you was busy. He said, well, everybody thinks that, so they don't call me out. <laughs> so I've got Norman Walker in the studio with me and Musto, and then Al was in town, and he come and put some guitar on, got some guest people on, and then, you know, lockdown, everything took a bit of a backseat, which was kind of good in a way, because I'd been playing, I'd been really busy, and we'd been to Japan with Al, with my core band, with Al playing guitar on it. And I was like, lockdown, that was all right. And then I was getting a bit twitchy, you know. And a few charity things were happening where people online would make a record without ever being in the same room, you know. And I thought, well, you can do that, and it kind of works. The only thing, you don't get drunk together and have a laugh, you know. Um, and sometimes there's a musical spin-off from that, but there isn't really when you listen back the next day. And then I wrote a few more songs, and I thought, and because I couldn't go in the studio in London with my guy, I asked Clem, I said, can you get in the studio? And he said, yeah, why? And I said, well, I've got a couple of songs. Will you put some drums down for me? And he said, yeah, I'd love to. So that's how that happened. So he's on two tracks on the album. You make it sound so easy. You know, it takes some people so long to get off the ground to do anything. But you're a very prolific guy when it comes to Well, it's to funny, there's this thing, you know, there was a whole Blitz club scene where led to the new romantics thing, which Midyear and Rusty Egan started, and it kind of broke up the rich kids. Right. There was a big TV documentary on it not long before I came away. And in it, one of the running threads is that Spandau Bailey, who was friends of ours, Gary Kemp played with the rich kids when Steve New passed away. They're forming their band, and they got clips of other things that were going on at the time. By the time they'd done their first gig, they got the little clip of the Sex Pistols with me in it, the Rich Kids with me in it, and Iggy Pop with me in it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's pretty And they cool. haven't even done their first gig yet. Oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, crap. But good luck to them, you know. <laughs> so, um, so after this Blondie tour, what do you have coming up? Well, I've got gigs of my own in England yeah, the through that, and then we're booking stuff for later on the year. You're not uh, stopping, you got, you're just... Something, I don't, time, I'm getting on, time's running out. You know, I'm proud of this record that I made and Cooking cu cooking Vinyl are gonna put out the last couple of albums I made that really didn't get promoted properly. You know, I just want people to hear my stuff. Yeah. It's good, you know, I'm proud of it. We're looking forward to the Roxy show. We know yeah, about that. Yeah, it should be good. Yeah, yeah it should be fun. And that's a good venue to... To see yeah. a band like yours to really see. Well, but we actually played there with Pistols as well. Yeah? Wow. It was a, it was a warm up show a few years back. A few years back. So, but you're looking back, what what were some of your, your favorite gigs with any of your bands? Like, is there anything that stands out? Well, a really early one we did was we played at Chelmsford Maximum Security Prison for the inmates, you know, a bit like Folsom Prison kind of thing. Uh -huh. And we did that, and Paul had, had, had been an apprentice electrician at Watney's Brewery, and he passed out that morning, and he turned up, and they gave him a good drink, and he turned up, and he he'd had, a, had a few, and there's a bootlegger, and you can hear him falling off the drum stool, but he doesn't <laughs> miss the beat. Wow. And when we went on stage, um, uh, John goes, good to be playing to a, um, I'm sorry, I must have heard, I forgot his little phrase, you know, to, a, you know, a tied audience or something, you know, a captive audience like yeah. that. And there's all these blokes <laughs> like that. I'm like, oh. yeah, that's crazy. That, was, that was fun. That was really early on. I really enjoyed playing with Iggy at that show at the Palladium with the Cramps. That's really cool. Supporting us. I dug the Headline and Fuji Festival with the Faces, my all time favourite band and band that I used to stand in front of the mirror when I was 14, you know, yeah. hey, with me, and I'm playing with them, you know. Yeah, that, that's kind of cool. But I've done loads of things I'm quite ha happy about, you know. And then in recent years, I did a few for love kind of things, but um, I, I went to play in Korea with a like, pickup band for a festival that was the DMZ festival, actually on the demarcation zone. Really? Right on the DMZ? Between North and South. Career. That, that wow. was interesting. I went and played, there was a thing in Palestine. 
with a crowd of people I went and it was a showcase for Palestinian bands and they're pretty put upon there, you know, pretty put upon. What was the crowd like? What was the reaction like? How did they act? Well, the thing is, when you go around the world, crowds are the same. Yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody should travel all the time. Might not be so good for the planet. You know, everybody wants to put food on the table for their family. They want somewhere to live and they want to let off steam without too much let or hindrance. That's the main thing of everybody all around the world. And until you go and see it, everybody's the fucking same. You know, I've, oh, I'm just curious. So outside of music, what are, what are some of your other interests? Um, I kind of sort of dabble in the art world. You know, when I'm traveling, I get to go and see art exhibitions. And because I went, um, now, if the Pistols played at our college, I booked and I, I got into the degree in fine art painting, but I never went because in the summer holidays, I decided to take it seriously. But art schools, it appears, are really big business. And over the years, lots of people have gone to St Martin's because I keep going on about how oh, we played at St Martin's. You know, it, yeah. they don't get in because of, they like that, but it, it sows the seeds. And lots of foreign students pay top whack fees. And last summer, I got made a fellow of the arts at St Martin's, and I got a picture of me with a, a mortar board on that Clem came along to, actually, although he's a doctor of drumming in some place, and, wow. and I got awarded it by this top artist in England who's actually the, um, the principal of the University of London called Grayson Perry, who's like a cross-dressing <laughs> big bloke. And still Big wears. Nice. <laughs> he, he is, but his art's fantastic. He that's does. Right. A, no, that's cool. Man. He's a ceramicist yeah. that makes these great tapestries, stuff like that. You know, my dad used to say, "Little fish are sweet," and you know, and all these little things are kind of cool. But on the other hand, you know, I'm not in London. What my interest is, to, what's going on with the government in London is terrible. And if there's a march going, I'm on it. In fact, a couple of songs on the album. I went on a march, which might as well call the Brexit, is Dopey March, and I bumped into um, Kevin Rowland from Texas Midnight Runners, who's you know a long-time friend that you see every now and then. And we're marching along Piccadilly to, to the Houses of Parliament with like a million other people, and there was some big raster guy on a you know a tricycle that you pedal with a trailer on the back, and he had a big get a blaster playing music, and he was playing. Let's Stick Together by Brian Ferry, you know, his version of... Um, and I thought, what a great place to have your song played on a march to Parliament, you know, so everybody keeps together. That's when I sort of came up with a head on a stick and the consequences coming out. That's great. Um, well, you know what? Uh, do you have any, any final words of wisdom you can share? Anything... Uh, you know, it ain't done until the fat lady sings. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. I think that one thing people can take from your career is stay active. Stay active, keep moving. Well, well, one thing, you know, I spoke to another friend of mine, Slim Jim Phantom, who played on my previous album. Um, you know, you can sit around waiting for David Bowie to call you up, you know, for the right gig. It ain't going to happen. Might do, it's certainly not going to happen now, sadly. Or somebody can suggest something, you go, yeah, I'll give it a go. You know, so sitting around, we get sick. Sitting around waiting for the phone ring. Biget sitting around waiting for the phone ring to look to ring. Or oh, somebody can suggest something. You go, yeah, all right, then, and it leads to other things. Okay. Just be consistent, right? I agree. Mm. I agree. But you know, that's not only like that in music. That's life in general. Really. Yeah, it's not. It's not good to stay static. You know, there's no progress mentally. Yeah. Whatever. But that's um, no, it's great, man. I I um. Uh, I don't think I have anything else. I hate to circle back though, but I just got to ask you: when you played with the Faces, when you got to play with them finally, was that a bit surreal for you? Did were you a little bit starstruck? This is a band that you. Well, a of course, but, but a of course, but b, it kind of felt natural somehow. I've been mates with Mac. I've been in with Lagan. I've been hip to that he wanted to reform the band. I did say to him, "Look, you know, if you do do it." Ronnie Lane had passed away by then, and I said, well, look, you know that I know, that you know that I might be the right bloke for the job. So I put a word for him. He did, and he called me up and he said, Glenn, right, okay, you're in, you're in, 
are you sure you're up for this? I said, Mac, I know all these songs backwards. He went, great. I said, it's just forwards I struggle with. And he laughed. And, <laughs> and there it was. Yeah, and there it was. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so where can people find you? Like on social media and all that? Oh, well, I'm on Facebook, Glenn Matlock. Instagram, Facebook. Look up Glenn I got I got a website, glenmatlock.co.uk. Somebody nicked glenmatlock.com. Now, what good? It would do them having my name. I don't know. And all they do is they nick things off of my site and put it up on it. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, that's the not a good business move, you know. Mm. That's great. I hate that. Yeah. It's your name, your, like, your likeness, and you see it on some random website. What's going on? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we right. appreciate you taking the time talking to us. Thanks for having the interest. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, so thank you. Fantastic. Good, man. Thank Thanks, you. Bob. Appreciate it. All right, cool. Thank you. Good.